Well, hello, welcome to our at the table service tonight here at Western Boulevard Presbyterian Church on the second Sunday of July. It's wonderful to see all of you here with us in this virtual space. And if you're watching a recording of us, we welcome you. We hope you find in this time of worship and encounter with the living, loving God. Um, we're gathering tonight uh, in person. I wanted to mention a couple of special things in the next two weeks uh, with our at the table service. Next Sunday, uh, we have the joy of welcoming Natasha Sanders, who will be our guest preacher. She's going to preach at both the morning service and at our at the table service next Sunday. Um, and I know she's a familiar face to a lot of you, um, as she was a past member and, and her family was very active, especially in this service. Um, and she's going to be in town uh, to help lead on our Presbytery's Matthew 25 mini conference that'll happen on next Monday on July 22nd over in Durham. Uh, so we great, we're great. we looking forward to welcoming Tarsha next Sunday uh, as our guest preacher. Uh, and then the following Sunday on July 28th, we will be back. We'll have an in-person service that, that day. It'll be another poetry and praise service. Um, and we invite anyone who has their has a gift of writing and, and whether it's poetry or prose or narrative uh, to feel free to share that as a part of our worship. Uh, feel free to reach out to Van Anthony or I. Uh, we would love to include, uh, invite you to, to share or if you'd rather one of us to share what you write, we're happy to do that as well. Um, but we're, we're looking forward to that uh, service once again as we gather in person on July 28th. Um, so we look forward to that. So let's begin our worship this evening. And I will put up here on the screen our opening call to worship. The word of the Lord will not return empty. It will accomplish all that God intends. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss. You shall love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Ben Anthony, I'll invite you to introduce our opening song this evening. Our opening song is our praise team singing, um, Lord, you're welcome into this holy place, written by Don Condon, C-O-N-D-O-N. Wonderful. Wonderful to see another singer joining you all. That was great. Welcome, Katie. Our scripture tonight is from the book of Ephesians, from chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. May God add a blessing to the reading of God's word this day. Five years ago, I had the privilege of participating in a credo conference that's sponsored by the Board of Pensions of our denomination. These conferences are designed for clergy at various chapters in their active ministry, early, mid-career, and nearing retirement. They're designed to help pastors evaluate where they are in their vocation, what needs they have to address with their physical, emotional, and spiritual health, and for clergy to develop plans for a healthy work-life balance, work-life balance moving forward. I keep a little stone on my desk as a reminder of my time at Credo for the lessons I took from there so I might serve faithfully in a healthy and balanced way. I appreciate it deeply the new friends I made from across the denomination at Credo. One of those new friends was Byron Wade, who was one of the faculty members that week, but at, a, at that time was also pastor at Davy Street Presbyterian Church here in Raleigh. Dur that, during a time in my ministry when I was feeling a little lonely and isolated, that, that week of Credo was a gift to connect with new friends and colleagues. And it was a reaffirmation of my gratitude for being part of a connectional church. One of the friends I made that week was Allison. She was a pastor in Virginia and she was so excited because she was getting married later that year. Her fiance, Drew, was older than her, and he had a teenage son by his first marriage. But it was so clear by the way that she talked about him that they were a great match. And I remember all of us surrounded her in prayer the day that we departed, praying for her and, and the upcoming marriage. And then I noticed through Facebook posts and, and messages that it was evident they had a beautiful celebration with their families and friends at their wedding. It, it couldn't have been more than six months after their wedding that I remembered seeing a post from Allison on Facebook that I had to read twice to make sure that I had read it correctly. She said that Drew was in the hospital with abdominal pain and that further testing revealed that he had stage four colon cancer. Less than a year after they were married, Allison and Drew were faced with a devastating diagnosis. <coughs> Excuse me. Their lives turned from dreaming about their future to surgeries, chemo and radiation treatments and the unknowns that lay before them. It wasn't the plan they had dreamed about. It was the new reality they had to face with faith, faith and courage. When I studied 
began studying this passage from Ephesians this week, the first thing that jumped off the page for me was, just as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. Being Presbyterian, I read that and I thought of the doctrine of predestination or election. It's a doctrine that has been misinterpreted and misrepresented throughout many years. And I could see how someone might say to Allison and Drew, well, this is all part of God's plan, which was already set in motion by God before the two of you even met. Such a statement would not only be incorrect, but also incredibly insensitive to the reality that they were facing. The doctrine of election or predestination has understandably raised many, many questions for Presbyterians and other believers. And if God has chosen those who are saved, then have others been chosen for damnation? Where do we fall on this divine scorecard? Or does this mean that all have been saved? And if that's the case, then what's the point of conducting mission or being a disciple? Maybe these are questions you've asked of yourself of this core belief. Maybe you're asking them right now. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul is speaking with enthusiasm, joy, of God's glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. Paul is reminding the church that this is a beautiful and extravagant gift from God, God's love in Jesus Christ. Because we have been loved so extravagantly in Christ, God has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather all things in him in heaven and things on earth. George Stroop writes, election is about the sovereignty of God's will. Election is good news because it affirms that those who are in Christ belong to God, not because they are less sinful than other people, or because they've done the right things, but for no other reason than God has chosen to be merciful to them. God's grace is not a response on God's part to what human beings have done, but is that which precedes or comes before faith and is its source. God's election is always in Christ. And Christ is the looking glass in which Christians should contemplate this election. At the birth of Christ, the angels announce God's good will to the world. If election becomes an occasion for anxiety or uncertainty, then it's been misunderstood. The appropriate response to God's election is gratitude and doxology. Election reminds us that we are adopted children of God. God destined us for adoption. Our inheritance is utterly gratuitous. Election is not a, is not a right, but is a gift. Finally, God's election does not make Christians special in relation to other people but calls them to specific tasks of serving God and serving neighbor. Election is the good news that God's grace in Jesus Christ precedes us, surrounds us, and sustains us. Or in the words of 1 John, we love because God first loved us. Paul uses the image of being adopted 
into God's inheritance through God's gift of Jesus Christ. Some of you know firsthand what adoption is like, either as ones who have been adopted or having adopted children into your family. I imagine all of us can remember a time when we were welcomed, not because we had blood relations with others, but because we were loved for who we are. That feeling can be incredibly powerful as we recognize that others see us, value us, and love us without any conditions placed upon us. Because we have been marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit as members of God's great family, we're called to live lives of gratitude for this gift. We live each and every day as a pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of God's glory. We don't live with fear and anxiety about our eternal existence. We don't live judging how others are surely not claimed by the loving embrace of God. That is God's business. It's not ours. Our business is to recognize how God has blessed us in Jesus Christ and to seek to live lives that offer God's blessing to others. So what does that look like? It looks like meeting an immigrant family who moves into the neighborhood. Their faith is different, but their needs are pressing. Help with transportation so that they might find employment. Food and basic necessities for their children. How to navigate a new country's language and culture that's so foreign to them. Instead of ignoring them, we turn toward them with gratitude for all that we have been given. Energy is spent to mobilize resources for their needs. Intentional time is spent learning their story. As we have been blessed, we seek to bless them. It also looks like recognizing that we always have something to learn no matter our age, our education level, or our status. While we have life experiences which can help others learn, we are creatures who have not learned everything ourselves. So it might be in our vocation, as we hear a new idea from a younger adult. It might be in our neighborhood, as a retiree teaches us how to fix something in our home might be from a stranger who offers a perspective which we never considered that helps us in our relationship with our partner. Whenever we welcome a new member into the church, you will always hear me say what my father said throughout his ministry. And when we welcome someone new into the church, we are welcoming change. We have as much to learn from them as they have to learn from us, all of which is the work of God's Holy Spirit. As we are a blessing to others, we are blessed to grow by God's work through others. For Allison and Drew, the story did not have a Hollywood ending. Drew's cancer eventually was too great for all the treatments and surgeries he endured. Drew died in 2022, less than three years after he and Allison were married. She and Drew's son and their entire family were left in a state of shock and of grief. And what I've noticed about Allison in these months that followed Drew's death was that she was honest and transparent about her journey of grief. 
She let her emotions be raw when that felt right for her. And she was reflective when that felt right for her. She pushed back on those people who, yes, did say things like, this is all part of God's plan. But she gave herself the space she needed to live through her grief. And she relied on others to help her and her family when they needed it the most. She and Drew were a blessing to one another, recognizing how God had brought them together. They were a blessing to others, where even in pain and loss, they showed the world how they trusted in God's love in Jesus Christ. And they were blessed by family, friends, strangers, who gave them strength, comfort, safety, and love when it was needed the most. Perhaps most importantly, there was no concern or anxiety over Drew's eternal home, for they both knew and celebrated the extravagant love God had showered on them in Jesus Christ, loved unconditionally as God's beloved children. May we all trust in that central tenet of our faith so that we might be a blessing to others who need to hear once again that they are blessed by their living, loving God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In response to God's word, I would invite us to declare our faith. And tonight we will share another passage from Paul, from his book to the Romans. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We come now to a time when we lift up our prayers for ourselves, for others, and for our world. Um, let me share with you our prayers. We remember uh, tonight Mac Winslow's father, uh, who continues to recover uh, following a stroke that he suffered two weeks ago. Um, and continues to recover from that. He is in a skilled nursing center at the moment in a rehab uh, in, in Durham. And so our prayers are with him and with all of Mac's family. Emily Lorbacker is grateful for everyone's prayers for her mother-in-law, Marcy. She had um, successful surgery this past Monday in Michigan for cancer in her liver, and that all went well. She was able to return home uh, Wednesday and is doing well. And so we are, we are grateful for that. Um, we had a wonderful evening last night um, celebrating our long partnership with Yavre Jair Children's Foundation in Haiti. Uh, there were at least five or six churches or organizations represented uh, at the church and Van offered his gift of music and Shedlin was able to be with us and shared directly about what is happening there. Um, we had a beautiful dinner and, and a lovely time just remembering and giving thanks and also how we can continue to support uh, Shedlin and the children and the people of Haiti in what continues to be a very tumultuous time. Um, so many, many thanks to all who came and supported. And once we have, um, once we've counted all the checks and donations, I'll be sure to share with everyone the deep, great generosity that folks shared uh, in supporting uh, this important mission partner that we've had for many, many years. I would ask, are there other, other prayers that you wish to lift up this evening as a part of our worship tonight? And feel free to unmute yourself 
and share them as a part of our time. Our prayers of thanksgiving for my friend Peggy, who had open heart surgery on June 11th and had some complications on June 12th. Um, she has finished rehab and is home. Um, I was able to visit her just a couple days before she left rehab, and she looked amazingly well, considering all she's been through, especially. So prayers of thanksgiving for that. Um, I had had the church praying for her um, several months ago, um, the prayer chain. So prayers answered. Thank you for lifting that up. Holly, I, I wondered if you'd be willing, I know you shared through the prayer chain about your dear friend Shaz and her grandmother. Would you be willing to lift, lift her up and share with us? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Shaz's grandmother uh, died the evening after I, I put them back on the, the prayer chain. And it really, it's a relief, I think, for for all of us and um so Shaz now is going through the process of making all of the arrangements that you have to do and starting to probate her grandmother's estate and she's still trying to settle the probate of her father's estate it's going on 18 months now and she's trying to find out how to contact grandmother's nearest relatives in Japan and Shaz does not speak any Japanese and the Japanese relatives don't speak any English and so it's going to be rather challenging um, so if you could just remember Shaz as she's doing all the necessary things that you have to do after someone passes away when you're not necessarily in the best shape to be doing those things the business of death is very hard when you're yes. in, a, in a good place, but when you have other things, it's very challenging. So we will yes. we'll hold Shaz in our prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others? Um, I'd like to uh, lift up uh, Norma uh, Marti, our a former yeah. member of the church. Um, she has a partially blocked uh, mitral valve, yeah. and um, she's going to have to have some sort of stint put in and i guess uh, they're going to do uh what is it, a cat scan i guess to determine whether she can have the simple surgery or whether she needs the more complex surgery so we're praying that the blockage is small so she can do the simple surgery yeah thank you joe we will hold hold norma in our prayers as she awaits the testing and what what the next steps will be thank you For our prayers this evening, um, I'll focus and lift up what transpired yesterday in Pennsylvania in our country and ask us all to center ourselves and uh, turn ourselves to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, we come to you tonight with many concerns of people we love and situations who who are close to us and of concern to us, and we know you hear those who are grateful for your presence in this way. We also come to you recognizing that almost 24 hours ago, we witnessed another act on a very public stage of gun violence. We are deeply saddened for those who lost their lives. We are grateful that former President Trump was not more seriously wounded. We are grateful for the response of first responders who were there to care for, to protect. We pray for those who witnessed this violent act for adults of all ages, for children, for how they will cope and live with this as a part of their memories and, and lives. 
we ask, O oh God, that you also remember all in our country who were affected by gun violence yesterday, whether it be in our city, our state, or throughout this nation. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would work through the lives of our leaders at all levels to take positive, actionable steps to make our nation safer. And may we in our lives do whatever we are able to do to also bring that to bear. And we pray this evening, we pray this evening for our country. We pray that the rhetoric that foments such violence would come to an end, that we would find a way to not take actions that are violent, but to use words, to use ways of relating to one another, even when we disagree, that are respectful, that still recognize in our neighbor that they are a child of God. And it begins with us, Lord. It begins with us and how we seek to relate to one another so help us do whatever we are able to be models for that. Because we are nervous, we are scared, we are anxious. And we need to know, we need to hear, do not be afraid. Loving God, we thank you that we can always turn to you in times that are hard, and you never abandon us. And we are grateful this evening to hear that nothing in life or in death will separate us from your love in Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we offer these prayers and conclude by saying together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Dan, I'll invite you to introduce our closing song, please. We have a recording clip of um, a guest we had a while back, Benjamin Pierre, and he's assisting me with the song titled Go in Peace. Wonderful. As we go from this place, seeking God's peace in a world that feels far from peaceful, will we always hold on to the fact that we were first and forever loved by God in Jesus Christ with extravagance and grace 
And that was a choice God made on our behalf so that we might live in the freedom of that love and to seek to share that every day that we have the opportunity to be here so that others might know that God loves them, God will always be with them. Let's go from this place in peace, trust and serve the Lord. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and always. Amen. Thank you Amen. all for here tonight. I hope you have a good week. Stay cool. We'll look forward to being back together next Sunday with Natasha as our guest preacher. Amen. Okay. Amen. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye, Amy. <laughs>